Thanks, everyone. So my name's Mark Fletcher. Please call me Fletch. I'm the Vice President of Public Safety Solutions at 911 Inform. I've been in public safety and telecommunications since I graduated high school some four decades ago. Um, I find this absolutely fascinating because public safety technology is technology that has just stagnated for the last 30 or more years. So what I want to do is I want to show you a little bit on how 911 works today so you have a better understanding of what next generation 911 is going to be doing. And that you'll understand right away because that's all current stuff. But I think you'll be surprised on why 911 is so broken uh, today. And we're going to be talking about connected buildings. So what is 911? Why is it there? It's there for one simple reason, to create a short code that's easily remembered to where you can reach emergency services no matter where you are in the country. Prior to 911, if you needed police, fire, or ambulance, you needed to know the seven or 10 digit number of that agency for the area that you were in. So 911 solved the problem of being, I'll connect you with whomever. E911 is enhanced 911. So 911 started in the US about 1968. In the late 70s, early 80s, someone said, hey, you know, we really need to know where these people are. Caller ID, as we know it today, didn't really exist, but there was a thing in the network called Annie, automatic number identification. It was used for billing. That did exist. A new infrastructure was put in place called the 911 tandem or the selective router. And since the phone company placed your phone at a particular location, their records were spot on to where that device was. So the telephone number was the perfect identifier to identify an individual device and to identify where its location was. Every device had its own unique phone number. And this was used to route the call based on location. But wait a second, this is an analog voice network. How did I get data? across that network. The only way to do that is with those loud screeching boxes. You've got mail. So what they did was they added two databases into the selective routers. The first was the Annie database we talked about, automatic number identification. Think of it as caller ID at the network level. And the other database was the Alley database, or automatic location information. You would take the phone number, and the 911 center would form a data query back into the network and says, who belongs to this number? And over an external data connection, they would receive this information back. Pretty reliable. Phones didn't really move without administrative control, so the data was all there. But this was really kind of clunky on how this all happened. You had this back and forth transmission of data. The Annie was only seven or ten digits, depending on where you were in the country. And the data that was returned was 240 bytes. That's it. 240 characters. And it didn't have great information there. 
address information, and a bunch of other stuff not really relevant to the location of the call, just dispatch type information. And the alley delivery happened over an X.25 connection, basically RS-232. Very limited. And what most people don't know, here's an example of a center that's five miles from my house up in northern New Jersey, deep in the woods, bear country, deer, very secluded, 45 minutes out of D.C. This center cost $12 million in 2012 to build. Inside that building, state-of-the-art, 911, an emergency communications center, 911 dispatch, OEM, public safety administration, and an EOC. It's built to be the equivalent of a LEED Silver Level Certification. I have no idea what that means, but it looked pretty damn impressive. So I put it on this slide. It's got two 600 kilowatt generators capable of powering that building, each at full load for 72 hours. And it's got a full kitchen and bunk quarters, male and female, 10,000 gallons of diesel fuel, and a water tower right back by the radio tower. This building is sustainable off the grid, fully operational for at least a week, if not 10 days. In the middle of this beautiful data center and in the 911 center of every single PSAP or ECC in New Jersey is a pair of those. Modulator demodulators, modems. These are the Achilles heel of the, of the 911 network today. Look at the speed. Blazing, 9,600 baud. When you transport, yeah, I see you laughing. That's okay. But that's what's there. The biggest problem is when Radio Shack went out of business because they couldn't get power supplies. That's what's there. This is why next generation 911 and the core services are absolutely critical and an urgent priority for the public safety industry, as well as moving off of this, this network infrastructure. So we talk about the great migration from this analog-based network over to an IP-enabled next-generation 911 network. How do you migrate? fact of the matter is, you can't. Migration is a myth. You cannot migrate this network any more than you can take a black and white TV and make it a color high def set. You're going to have a floor full of parts that you can't use. Transition is what's really going to be there. You build the new next-gen 911 ESINET, Emergency Services IP Network. The next-generation 911 PSAPs, they connect. Standard Ethernet connections, LAN, WAN connectivity. For the legacy networks that are out there, the easiest thing is to put a legacy network gateway. Who can guess what a legacy network gateway does? Provides a gateway to legacy networks and converts it to next gen. On the egress side, you do pretty much the same thing. You build a legacy PSAP gateway to talk to all the orphans that are out there 
that haven't converted to next gen, and for those that have, you deliver them over an IP network. Now, for the 911 centers that are legacy, how do we get their data, advanced data, into the network in a transitional state? And if I've got an orphaned legacy piece app, how do I deliver new data to them when all I have is that US Data Robotics 9600 modem? And that's done through what some next-gen purists call an evil thing, but it's reality, and that's over the top, and it works. And there's nothing wrong with it in a transitional state. It'll let a legacy network on a separate channel utilize the internet or any IP network to deliver IP content to that next generation 911 PSAP. And on the bottom, it'll let a next generation 911 origination network deliver that data to a legacy PSAP over the internet. All they need is an HTML browser. It's that simple. For 20 years, we've been beating our head against the wall trying to figure out how to convert one to the other. Just change it. We probably could have done it five times over with the money. So next gen 911, what does this thing do for you? For the first time ever, anywhere, you have a set of APIs that can provide you with real-time connection to the public safety next generation 911 network and do that nationwide. You can deliver a call anywhere in North America and you can provide the data about location in real time. No more pre-provisioned databases. The way 911 worked, Warren would call me. I look up Warren's caller ID and know where Warren lives. That's where I route the call if it's in my local area. And that's the information I display. If that hit a network that wasn't local, couldn't go anywhere. 911 is built in all these various silos. But now that I've got an IP network, there is no boundary. And I can deliver that situational awareness dynamically. That's pretty cool. When you've got an IP-based platform and a SIP-based platform, 911 events start occurring, not calls. Now read it all with me, but wait, there's more. Collecting device location is the big mystery for voice over IP. For the most part, devices are static. However, where I've got IP devices that are subject to move, network forensics exist that let me isolate where a device is located so I can create a location record. Does anybody need uh, home warranty insurance? <laughs> I got a guy. I can isolate down to a particular building. I can isolate down to a particular campus. This will give me, for the most part, what we call front door address response. Not perfect, but it's good enough to get emergency services where I need them to go. And from there, 
I can provide information on site through a wall display. When was the last time you were in Best Buy? 55 inch color TV, just the other day, 269 bucks. Web enabled. I can display anything I want on that. I'll bet you anybody in this room could build an application that displayed a map of where people need to go on that TV in about, I don't know, 10 minutes. Beyond that, we've got subnets. Once I'm in a building, I can break a building up into logical zones or response areas, do a little work on my network to align subnets or DHCP scopes to deliver that, letting first responders know where to go, either when they get on site or with the call. And quite frankly, when I'm pulling the truck out of the garage, the firehouse, I don't need to know that you're in cube 2C231. That doesn't mean anything to me anyway. It's about getting the right data. But it also lets me deal with what floor that particular caller is coming from. Or if I have remote workers, COVID, company sends home a thousand employees. They've all got voice over IP on their laptops or their business hard phones that they bring home. The law says you've got to provide 911 services. You sent a thousand people home, you just opened up a thousand single user remote offices that are on a PBX infrastructure that might not be anywhere near those individuals. Ultimately, if a device can't be located, I can flag it as non-compliant. It's workflow. I can't find this device. There's nothing wrong with that. Let me escalate that to a supervisor. You need to figure out where this device is because network discovery won't let me locate it. Fix it manually. There's nothing wrong with that. You fixed the bulk of the problem. And don't ignore direct user GPS assist. Pretty much everybody's carrying one of these. This knows where it is. It knows where it is from GPS. It knows where it is from the cellular networks. It knows where it is from the hotspot Wi-Fi access points that it sees that are in a big database that was owned by a company called Skyhook years ago. It's now owned by Google. It's the MAC address of every single access point that's out there that's been populated in this database based on this phone knowing about where it is and saying I can see this, 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 and this. And with enough of that data crowdsourced, that database is accurate to about three feet, believe it or not. So I ping the device. Hey, I know you're not the device I'm going to call 911 from, but where are you? Because the guy that you're with, I need to know where he is so I know where his phone is that he just logged on. I can send him an email, click here. I can send him a text message, click this URL. HTML5, boom. I can extract the location data out of that intelligent device and make the assumption, are you here? This is where it looks like you are. Yeah, I am. Or no, I'm next door. Not hard to get the information. But we talked about 911 being more than a call. In today's connected world of networks, 
and the vast landscape of IoT devices that live out there, these are huge, huge resources that are virtually untapped in the commercial enterprise space. But they hold incredible data about location, about the environment. Let me give you a couple examples. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you get a 911 call. The 911 operator sees that on the screen. A phone number, ABC Supply Company, and an address. 911, police, fire, medical. Hello, hello, anybody there? Nobody's there. What's their protocol say? Well, I gotta check it out. Respond to 425 Western Avenue, ABC Supply, 911 hang up call. No idea what's going on. Now, let's look at next generation 911 with that same scenario with additional data. I've got the call, but I've also got correlating information that says there's a high temperature alarm, a smoke condition on the second floor north. What's the dispatcher gonna do then? 911, what's your emergency? Hello, hello, nobody there? Okay. Now my dispatch is gonna be, hey, I'm rolling fire to 425 Western Ave, ABC Supply Company. I've got a report of smoke and a high temperature on the second floor north. Guarantee you the response is gonna be a little bit faster of somebody driving to that scene. Tie in personal devices. This knows when I fall. This, what, this is called 911. You can't see it from there, but there's a nice little scar there because I'm an idiot and I tripped over a planter in a parking lot. Bang, eight stitches. Do you need 911? <laughs> yeah. I do. This is one you're gonna to wanna to take a picture of. I'll give you this deck. Next Gen 911 under the covers. It's pretty simple. We install a listener module that listens for call events. It listens for a PBX making a 911 call it listens to an IoT device saying, hey, I've gone out of spec, it's too hot, I smell smoke, my video camera has detected a weapon, my facial recognition said Warren Bent just walked through the front door, not good. Sorry, come on, what do you think, I'm not gonna take a pot shot after all these years? It reports an event. It uses all the corollary information and sends that into the 911 network. We send the call today, not to 911, but we send it to an umbrella 911 network. Company we happen to use is bandwidth. Why? Because they give me the most control over APIs. Let me report the most information. And that all flows through into the Peace app, either over the top or direct in band. A list of things that we provide, carries log, ray bombs, Alyssa's law compliance, interactive maps, because I now can provide a link, because I've got an IP link between the PSAP and the originating network, I can initiate two-way protocols. I can give the police department control of that building, door locks, video cameras, paging systems. I can look at all the data in that building, Wi-Fi, cellular, manual queries. I can geofence the property and even pick up cellular events that happen in the parking lot or in the bathroom.
and through REST API calls and hardware gateways, I can pick up just about anything that barks, squeaks, squawks, or, squ or squeals. If it makes noise or raises its hand, chances are I can pick it up and I can report on it. Bandwidth, they provide the network validation. They provide the connectivity. I don't care if my local PSAP is using rotary phones or the highest tech brand new next gen because bandwidth will take care of that connectivity and I don't need to worry about it. And when they upgrade, I don't care. I send the highest level of data I can. They're going to send the highest level of data they can. And when that technology changes, they're managing that change. What do I need from you? Again, I need to know when devices register. I need to know who registered so I have a user profile. Why? Because if I can't find that user, I want to know what their cell phone number is so I can send them a text, so I can send them that link where I can query their location. I need to know about the 911 call events, obviously, what device made them, what number they dialed. And again, what registered user on them. That's it. Build that into the call server programs that you're building. And I've got all of the information I need. You don't have to worry about 911. You hand it off to me. We assemble all the data. We hand it off to the network. And it gets delivered to the PSAP. It doesn't have to be hard, but you need to build something. The penalty for each one of you in this room for not supplying something in your application is $10,000 plus $500 per day per endpoint. That's the current FCC law. Manufacturers, providers, Everybody, even myself, and the end user. Everyone is liable for that. Ray Bombs Act that was just implemented two years ago tightened up the 911 laws incredibly. Kerry's law, law that I wrote, took care of 911 access without that access code of nine. It killed a 31-year-old woman who was being stabbed 29 times in a hotel room in Marshall, Texas. Her nine-year-old daughter knew to dial 911, but didn't know she needed a nine. Her mother died three feet away from her. So that's my contact information. I'm willing to help anybody. Be happy to take any questions. This is important stuff, and it's up to all of you to be part of the solution. We got <clears throat> we got time for one question, Fletch. One yeah. question, if there is one in the audience. Are you sticking around for the rest of the show? Are you going to be here for? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's good. If anybody asks me what the number for nine one one is, you can leave now. <laughs> Okay, we got a question here, and I don't know if we have a mic runner in the room. We don't? Okay, so can you shout loud, sir? Uh, my, my local community has an app that I'm supposed to put my information in, so when I do 911, the app sends information to them. Local community has an app. It's Rave Mobile Safety, probably. Uh, he puts his information in. When he calls from that phone, his information goes. Your personal information goes. Your location doesn't go. And you've got to keep that up to date. Not a bad idea. Poor execution. My opinion doesn't do anything. And it doesn't give you location. I really don't care who you are. I care where you are. There's nothing left to say after that, is there, really? 
<laughs> I'm okay. kind of a straightforward guy. <laughs> yeah, maybe you guys can talk later. But for now, yeah. let's say a big thank you to Fletch. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate it.